Let us turn now to the question of how to adapt this journey to daily life in active ministry, family life, professional life in the world, or no life at all, if you want to call it that. You probably will be thinking at this point in our retreat, as it comes to a conclusion, how am I going to put some of this experience of, of prolonged prayer and meditation into daily life, into my daily life? And, and so it's extremely important, it seems to me, for lay folks and those who have an active ministry among people in the world, to have firmly in mind this principle that for you the primary practice is daily life. And, and being able to handle and be faithful to one's commitments and to the wear and tear of daily life is the arena in which spiritual progress takes place. In spiritual literature, the desert, the ocean, the forest, all these are symbols of the spiritual journey. And if you've ever taken a boat on the sea, you know that the sea looks endless. Or if you walk in the desert, there's no sign of life. It, it's, it, it's, it's that daily life which is the symbol of the endless routines, the, with it's the same faults arising and the same problems, same temptations constantly recurring, which seems to be taking us nowhere. The vision of endless space stretching out in every direction without life, without knowing what to do with it, and without being able to get away from it. So that the journey through the desert that we read about in the Bible that God subjected the Israelites to is, is simply a mirror of our own spiritual journey through what seems at times like the desert of life or the ocean of life, if you prefer that image. Now, if, if you don't see daily life that way and are committed to the spiritual journey, then what happens? As soon as a few difficulties arise, the thought comes, I must make another retreat. Well, maybe that could be a good idea, but that's not the answer. The answer is to try to see in daily life the, the gold mine or the treasures that are contained in ordinary events, which are inviting us to see them as part of our practice or the gift of ourselves to God. In other words, holiness is right under our nose and the possibility of enlightenment is in every moment and every event as it passes by. But we don't perceive daily life as the biblical desert, that is, a, a desert that is sanctifying, unless you have a practice of uh, of contemplative prayer. And so the centering prayer is, is the keystone leading to contemplative prayer of a commitment to the gospel, or more precisely, to the contemplative dimension of the gospel, by which I mean the, the guidance, both in prayer and in action, of the Holy Spirit. Now, in we have been uh, thinking a great deal about uh, centering prayer as we've been practicing it vigorously during this week. And, and I'm sure you have a sense now of the deep places to which it invites us, the quiet, the calm, and also the, the, the interior unloading of the undigested emotional stuff of a lifetime, which is the result of that rest and that peace the loosening up of our fossilized programs and, uh, and, and the inner soil of our soul, so to speak, which is so hard baked by the, by the emotional traumas that it doesn't let go of the weeds easily and hence needs deep rest and, and cultivation in order to allow the natural health of the body and psyche to, to expel or purge itself of harmful 
material that blocks the free flow of energy, makes it hard to be in the present moment and to relate to other people and to God. The, the centering prayer, contemplative prayer, as you can see, is addressed to the human situation exactly where it is. That is to say, it's, it, it's, it's designed to heal the disease which we call the human condition. And, uh, and in the Christian tradition, which is also called original sin, or the consequences of original sin, to be more exact. Other religions have different words for it. Maya, illusion, avidya, and so on. Now, if you accept and are convinced of the fact that you are suffering from a pathology, then you have a point of departure for the spiritual journey. And the pathology is simply this, in coming to full self-reflective self-consciousness without the experience of intimacy with God or of divine union. And because that reassurance is missing, the fragile ego desperately seeks other means of shoring up its vulnerability or defending itself from its loneliness or its sense of alienation from itself, from God, and from others. The fruit of, of original sin or the, is alienation. That's the bottom line. And, and this is why our emotional programs are so deeply rooted, because in early childhood and early adolescence, and, and then encouraged by a wrong use of reason, which backs up these programs, we have felt the need for greater defenses to protect our security, greater programs for getting what we want, and uh, whether it be pleasure or control over other people, power. So this is, is, a, is a sickness that can be cured. And in, and in the Christian point of view, the contemplative dimension of the gospel is the cure. Now, Anthony discovered and, and sort of organized in some degree, later other monastic founders organized it even more, he discovered the four basic elements to health, which is a certain amount of solitude, of silence of an exterior kind, both of which are designed, of course, to cultivate interior silence, Simplicity of life, not necessarily uh, uh, penury, but, but a, a, a reasonable use of the goods of the earth so as not to use up goods that other people need. And finally, a discipline for prayer and action. Now, monastic life simply is, is a program or an environment to practice all those things at once throughout daily life. Now, now, the contemplative prayer is a kind of extract, you might say, of this program, which combines those four elements into a kind of capsule. <laughs> and this is the period of, of, of uh, deep prayer that one can take every day and preferably twice a day. And so uh, we might compare the centering prayer period to an antibiotic. It's designed to heal the virus of original sin and its consequences. It's designed to pour into our, our uh, nervous system and brain and psyche this healing remedy consisting of an extract of solitude, silence, simplicity, and the discipline of prayer and action. In, in, during the prayer period, the discipline is primarily one designed to further the purposes of the period of prayer, interior silence, and so on. So, uh, like an antibiotic, it, it only works if you take enough of it. And so you need to find out what dose you should take. And there's two doses. One is a maintenance dose to keep you from going backwards, and another is a sufficient dose to, clear, clear, uh, to cure, rather, the disease. And so, if you only take it casually once in a while, 
no antibiotic is going to cure you. You have to take enough of the stuff to, to overcome the psychotoxins that the false self system with its frustrations and in its emotional turmoil is constantly pouring into the nervous system. And so the, the wisdom then of, 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 of making a contemplative prayer period and using some method like the centering prayer to further it is that it, it, it gives you a daily dosage, a regular dosage proportioned to your needs and begins to effect the healing of the disease. Now if you take it twice a day, you maintain the reservoir of healing that is contained in your daily capsules. And so, it, if, for instance, the, the morning period of, of, of centering produces in a, in a half an hour or so a certain reservoir of interior silence, peace, and spiritual poise. So you begin your day with that. Well, right away, as soon as you hit the street, so to speak, the events start pushing your, the buttons on your computer trying to activate those old programs of the energy centers and, the, and to give you the printout that goes with them. And so if you have a good reservoir in the morning, you can draw on it throughout the day. Now experience shows that the day is quite long and towards the end of the day, the morning reservoir of peace and silence begins to go down and, and, and the reservoir goes bone dry about four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. That's what happened to that person in the office who had <laughs> agreed never to get angry at this person who always got them angry and they did well until about that time of the day. So if you can have a second period during your lunch break or say at the end of work or before supper, this would give you another booster shot, so to speak, to get through the rest of the day and the evening's activities. Thus, uh, experience seems to show that two periods a day which maintain that reservoir uh, are more effective than one period a day or a longer one. It just moves the thing along faster. And so it's up to you to decide how sick you are and how much you want to get well, and how soon you want to get well. Now, it doesn't mean that you multiply the period unduly, but that you find out what is the normal period that you need to maintain a, a certain uh, contact with your interior reservoir of prayer throughout the day. It, it's, uh, if you don't do that, then you're somewhat like someone at the end of a pipeline after everybody else has taken the water and there's a limited supply. When you get in the shower and turn the thing on, nothing comes out. Well, to avoid that from happening, keep up the level of your interior reservoir by the faithful and regular practice of the two periods of centering prayer. Now, if you had time, I consider the most ideal arrangement to have an hour, say, in the morning that might begin with a little reading of scripture to focus your mind or some chanting or perhaps some, some uh, yogic uh, uh, hatha yoga exercises that are particularly calming of the, of the body. And, and thus your body uh, when you, and your mind when you enter into prayer will not persecute you with a certain amount of stress or, or, or wandering of the mind. However, as you progress, it gets easier and easier to enter into that attitude of letting go and surrender to God, and you can enter it almost at will, except if you just had a phone call with bad news or something. You then may need a little buffer, uh, like running around the block or <laughs> reading a book or something to calm down. Um, the, it's... it's uh, Well, the next step then would be to, uh, to perhaps have two periods a day or one continuous one that's a little longer in the morning, like 40 minutes, or two back-to-back -back periods of centering with a contemplative walk in between, during which time you might practice the active prayer if you've chosen one. And then another period of maybe a half an hour somewhere uh, throughout the rest of the day. But always keeping in mind that this kind of ideal program has to be adjusted to actual life. And as we saw, 
if one has to be available for one's spouse or children upon arriving home from work, it would, might not be the best thing to disappear as soon as you came into the house, into the cellar for your period of prayer. You have to be creative and, and try to work this thing out with deep respect for where the other members of your household may, may be or your other duties. <laughs>